time, we are ready to welcome our pastor, Svetlana. Everyone, please rise and welcome her. Thank you. I trust that you're having a good morning, a good morning in the presence of God in this house, and I hope that you will be having a good time as the Holy Spirit is beginning to enlighten the Word, impress it on your hearts, and get it sown real deep into your spirit. Um, I'd like for us to go ahead and pray before we read from Scripture and uh, Invite the Holy Spirit to do a revolutionary work in our hearts. Father, we're just grateful that your presence is among us, Lord. We thank you that you're here in person. We thank you that your glory is tangible. We thank you, Father, that you have things to teach us daily. And Jesus, you promised that the Holy Spirit is going to be with us so he can uh, remind us things that you taught us. And Father, we're just praying that our hearts would be open to you today, that the soil of our hearts would be worked on, that the seed that will be sown would truly penetrate and would bring forth fruit, maybe 30, maybe 60, maybe 100 fold. But Father, we are praying that it definitely would be productive and bearing the outcome that you desire for us. We commit this word to you today, and we are praying for your move of the Spirit this morning. Amen. Amen. I'm going to be sharing something with you that has been uh, brewing in my heart for a while. And um, I enjoy when the Lord begins to dig deep and uh, gives you insights and revelations on very familiar scriptures. So what I'm going to be doing this morning is really bringing to all of us a scripture that we all know. It's a very familiar uh, parable. It is about the seed that is being sown, and some of it grows and brings fruit, and some really doesn't produce anything. And so we all know that scripture. By the way, go ahead and find it in Mark chapter 4, and we'll read from verse 2 through 25. You know that? You know that parable? I know it's familiar. And a lot of us tend to just kind of shut things out of our minds when we know the scriptures, we know familiar passages, and we used to look at them in a particular way, we kind of glance over, glaze over those passages. And usually we don't dig deep for a, for a revelation that goes beyond what we have already acquired. So this morning, it's going to be challenging to all of us to find things in this particular scripture that is new for us that is going to go deep and actually have something to do with every one of us. Because this is one of those parables that as you read, you would say, oh, that doesn't apply to me. I'm Christian. I'm saved. That doesn't apply to me. I'm still in the faith. I wasn't choked by tribulations and troubles and, and desires. And so we tend to move aside most of this parable. But what I want to do today is bring this parable to the forefront and say to all of us, this scripture relates very pertinent this morning to all of our heart's conditions because we can find ourselves in those four places daily in concerning in regards to God's word. It is very challenging. So let's go ahead. Let's read that. Um, I will do my best to um, get you into connection groups on time. So, Mark chapter 4, 2 to 25. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where I did not have much soil, it sprung up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so that they did not bear grain. St 
Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced the crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. And by the way, when we read this, most of the times, we find ourselves in the fourth category and we say to ourselves, we definitely are producing at least 30% growth. We never identify with the first one. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. By the way, this is a freebie. Just want to open a parenthesis here. We say that most of the things that God said plainly were said to his disciples only. And the rest of them, they were all fed with parables. I, I challenge you to see this here. It says, when he was alone... Alone in, in, in what sense? He was removed from the big crowd, but the 12 and the others around him. So it's the 12 and everybody else that truly had an interest in Jesus Christ. He did not restrict anybody. As Brendan just said, Jesus Christ and his gospel is not for a special club. It is for whosoever. So it is the disciples and anyone that desired to stay close to him. Those people truly had the, the ear to hear and the heart condition to get it. So it is the twelve and the others around him ask him about the parables. And he told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. To who? The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to the apostles and anyone that truly felt that they want to be close to Christ. They saw him differently than the rest of the crowd. And they were attracted and went around him in an inner circle. The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to who? To all of us. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. And we read that and we say, oh, well, you know, I get it. I'm the chosen one and there are some others out there not chosen. Okay? Their ears are somehow divinely shut. They will be hearing and never perceiving. No, that is not the context. It is the disciples and any of those that chose to stay around Christ in close proximity in his influence. But the crowd out there that truly didn't care, they had a different heart's disposition. That is what clogged their ears. And they couldn't understand, they couldn't perceive what he's saying. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? He thought that's quite obvious, but they didn't get it. The farmer sows the word. So what's the seed? The word. Some people like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, who comes? Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like the seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times, 
what was sown. Consider carefully what you hear, he continued in verse 24. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. By the way, this is a very interesting statement right here, and we'll talk about what it means. By the measure you use, as you hear things, you measure them. And you make a decision if you're going to act upon what you heard. And so make sure you measure correctly what you heard. Whoever has will be given more, and whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And as we go through this parable, by the way, this passage will become quite clear what it means. Most often on the surface, it's a very unjust statement. Actually, it has a lot of logic in it, and it's totally righteous of Christ to say that. So most often, as I said, as we read this parable, we find ourselves where? In what category? In the fourth one. We are all producing fruit. Or so we think. This morning, I want to challenge you with this. As we go and as we discuss this parable, this is my question to you. Do you protect the seed the word of God, that God, through his spirit, sows in your heart daily. That's the word I would be talking about. The word of God, the seed we established is the word of God. So my question is, we go through the four categories of soil, and we'll talk what that looks like. My question to you is, examine yourself and see if you protect the word of God that is spoken directly to you, the rhema word, the active word of God that is released on your behalf today for you. What do you do with that word? Are you like the path or the rocky soil or the thorny place or you actually produce fruit? By the seed that has been sown in your heart through the Holy Spirit. So really, this parable is not about the seed. Does the seed bring fruit forth? This is not the question. Although, only the fourth place really produces any fruit. The question here that Jesus raises with his disciples and everybody else that wants to hear him is this. What is the heart's condition of the hearer that can produce fruit with the seed of God? So this morning is a time for examination of the heart's condition. And I want to present to you that there are four heart conditions that Jesus is talking about. But again, this parable, like anything else, in all of our human lives, do not arise in a vacuum. Jesus Christ didn't just all of a sudden decide to talk to them about seed and how the seed would produce fruit and which seed in which condition would produce the fruit. He never taught in vacuum. There was always a context for what he would say. So here's the context. He has just become a famous teacher. He did some miracles. People saw what he could do, and they began to realize there is something special about this particular teacher. This rabbi is beginning to support what he says by the deeds he does. Okay? Look through Mark, look before chapter 4, and you will see him performing miracles. So a crowd began to gather around Jesus Christ. The beginning of chapter 4 of Mark actually tells you how he inaugurates his disciples. He chooses the apostles. He chooses the 12. He chooses the students that are going to walk through life with him and would absorb his word, his teaching. Okay? 
So since now he's becoming quite popular, there is a crowd around him, and a lot of people want to touch him, want to see how he performs the miracles he does, because they do have tangible needs. They crowd around him, and it's lunchtime. He has some physical needs, but because of his ministry endeavors, his activity is really interrupted. His needs are not being met. So through the grapevine, his family hears that here he is now. He is in a house. He cannot even get lunch. He's going to starve himself to death, and all of those apostles he drugs with him. And they just do all kinds of crazy things. They just go around, talk to people all day long. He's just going to fall on the road, and that's going to be the end of him. So his family, as they hear that his physical needs are not met, this is what their reaction is. They say to themselves, he went crazy. He went nuts. The actual quotation, if you look in Mark, says... He's out of his mind. So his family decided that they're going to go and retrieve him. They're going to tell him how to live life. And it wasn't enough that his family didn't find him quite competent to do what he was doing and to say what he was saying, but actually the spiritual leaders of that time said that not only that he is out of his mind, but that he is actually demon-possessed. Read right before the passage we read. It says that the teachers of the law accused him that he does all of those miracles he does through Beelzebul, through Satan. <laughs> so two very important groups in his life. I'm talking about guys. We exist in community. We exist among people groups. We do not do anything outside of community. We need people to interact with us, to hear what we say, so it's going to produce some fruit out there where it lands. Two major people groups in that community declare Jesus incompetent, out of his mind, demon-possessed. Within that context, he says that parable. Within that context, he says, listen, when I speak, when my speech goes forth, some of those that hear it, by the way, some of those were his own family, some of those that hear it don't get it at all and allow Satan to come and snatch it immediately. And some respond with joy for a short time and then they fall away. And some allow the seed to begin to grow and then everything in life chokes what they heard. And only a small fraction actually is a good soil where the word that I share with them can produce a result. Well, that kind of wakes you up. Because we think that just because we found Jesus Christ to be our Savior, we automatically make him the Lord of our lives. <clears throat> and it's not an automatic thing. It is a, a thing of our volition that we would decide and would determine that we would follow Christ, not only trust him as our Savior, but would allow him the authority to seed his commandments, his laws, his speech will go forth, and it's going to fall on a heart's condition that's going to bear fruit with what he has commanded us to do. I'm telling you, it got me, and it gets even deeper. So now we're going to look at the four heart's conditions that Jesus Christ was describing in this parable. The first one I called the trampled heart condition. Why? Because those are the people 
Here it is. He describes them. Some people, that's in, in Mark 4, uh, verse 15, some people like seed along the path. See, he's not talking about the seed. He's describing the condition of the people. Some people are like the seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. So the first heart's condition, and again, my charge this morning to all of us is again, go through your heart and listen and check your heart and see if we act like that it, with some regularity. The trampled type of heart condition is those people that have no filters. They allow anybody and everything to walk on their understandings. Okay? They allow everybody to come and sway them one way or the other. Every thought that's out there in the world is worth listening to. Every idea is worth catching. There is no protection. The path is trampled place where everybody is having havoc in walking and interrupting your existence. And if you've allowed yourself to be under the influence of this and under the influence of that, under the influence of a chemical, under the influence of a person, under the influence of an abuser, under the influence of negativism, under the influence of the society's predominant worldview, under the influence of anything and everything that has decided to walk your path. And when your heart is in that condition, when God attempts to sow his seed on your heart's soil, it usually doesn't produce anything. Why? Because a trampled heart that has allowed anybody to walk on has allowed Satan's company as well. It has allowed the enemy of your soul to walk on you and to begin to seed things in you as well. And you accept them just as you would accept the word of God. Now let me tell you what the word take, as I may, uh, did some word search. It, it was curious, I was curious to see how is Satan taking away the seed? Because in my imagery, in my, in my picture, um, that I created as I read this was, okay, it's path, and the seed just fall on it and just lays out there, visible for everybody to see. Wouldn't you think that? Okay? And so it's easy for everybody to see that and to come and snatch it, and here Satan comes and walks and snatches that word that hasn't penetrated at all. I was curious to find out that the word take in Greek is actually aero. And probably aeration comes from that root word, that Greek root word. Let me tell you what it means. I'll read you the description. Aero means to raise up, to elevate, to lift up, to draw up a fish from the water. Okay? You don't just go and snatch a fish from the water. You cast, you know, and then you draw up that fish, and that fish fights, and you're drawing it up. And also it means to take away from another what is his or what is committed to him. To take by force. Well, that's what Satan does to the trampled heart. He comes and by force. He has to go and dig into the path. Even the trampled ground still allows the seed to penetrate, to fall into it, and to cover it with soil. But Satan goes and begins to unearth that seed and to draw it up, to lift it up, to elevate it from your heart. But let me tell you, Satan has no control over your heart. That tenacity that you see in your two-year-olds and your teenagers, the stubbornness that you call, where do you think it comes from? <laughs> it is your characteristic. Use that tenacity for a good thing, 
Be stubborn when Satan comes and tries to elevate, to grab, to take what's not his, and to draw the truth of God from your heart. For his word has been spoken into your land. And it has to remain in your heart to produce fruit. Don't allow the enemy of your soul to trample on your heart. And to have the time to dig out the word of God. But protect it for one thing you have. It's a free will. Satan doesn't own your will. God doesn't own your will. He allowed Adam and Eve to make their own choice. That much less Satan owns your will. You are created in the image of God. And he is a free-willed agent. And you are a free-willed agent. Do that. Fight the enemy for the word of God that has been spoken to you as a refreshing transformation word today. If you're fighting something, and if people are saying there is no way you can get out of this, you're too deep into it. There is no way you have the strength to pull yourself out. Do not believe those thoughts. Do not believe the enemy as he begins to seed his seed. Do not allow the seed of God to be taken away from your heart, but fight for it. For if you hide the word of God in your heart, you will produce fruit. The second soil condition is the rocky one. This is what Jesus says. Others, like seeds sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. So you know what? The rocky soil condition is what goes on in the heart. The first one, the trampled one, was, was what was going on in the whole of you. You allow trampled thoughts and people and ideas to just morph you and change you and make you hard as a rock. But the rocky soil, the rocky soil, is truly the things that go deep into the core of your being. This is who you are at the very core. This is what happens in your heart. Now that's interesting because we're going to talk about some uncomfortable truths. The Christian worldview that we all aspire. As we gather together on Sunday mornings, we come to uphold certain belief systems, certain doctrinal things. You know, certain things that we read in the Bible and we all say, absolutely, I agree to that. And we give assent to those particular truths. We say, yeah, mm -hmm. we aspire to that truth. But the reality of those that have a rocky condition of heart. What does it say? That seed germinates, but has no root. It means that although you have heard the word of God and you had joyfully agreed with whatever you heard about God and Christ and what he offers you, you did not go deep to root yourself. Your core believes, your heart's core is not rooted in the belief system that the Bible has. Now that's very uncomfortable. Because we have a lot of Christians around this globe and around this country that aspire to biblical truths. But when it comes 
to proving it, to acting upon it, a lot of people show that they have no root, that they do not act upon a core belief. Because you know what? Your actions actually show where you establish your beliefs. You can say all you want with your words, whatever you want. You can quote scripture, you can quote whole chapters if you want to. And you can say that you aspire to biblical understanding. But if you do not practice it, that has not become the core of who you are. So here it is. Those people that have a rocky foundation for the word of God to germinate, for the word of God to bring fruit, actually have not anchored themselves in totality, in full, on the rock of salvation. Because in Psalms we read that Jesus Christ is the rock of salvation. But they want to harbor the rock of salvation, but also they want to harbor all kinds of other rocks in their heart. Let me tell you, in our postmodern society, we have all kinds of rocks that we are trying to anchor our understanding and our belief system to. We have the rock of pluralism. We have many, many Christians that aspire by mouth to be a Christian and to believe in Jesus Christ. But at the same time, they think that maybe Muhammad and Krishna and Buddha can take us to eternal life, can take us there. They don't necessarily believe that Jesus Christ is the only path. Pluralism is okay because society believes in pluralism and we try to be relevant to society. We bend our Christian culture to fit within the postmodern societal worldviews. We cannot do that. Our Christian culture is counterculture to what society thinks. We also harbor the rock of relativism. Now, what is that? There is moral relativism. According to it, just think about it. Think about it. I'm not going to, I know I'm throwing a couple of words here, but they, they're very simple, and you see those people all around you. They believe the truth is established within the group. And if for this group, it's not moral to do a certain thing, then don't do it. But please, by all means, don't judge that other group that has decided to act according to their own moral understanding. So our society presently holds this worldview that there is moral relativism. And please, no group of people impose their morals on the whole because... This is not politically correct. So because we have been fed this over and over and over again through media, through everything that you pick up, your friends, your colleagues, your families believe the pluralism, believes the relativism, and you're saying to yourself, oh, well, yeah, maybe they're right. You know, I'm just going to keep to my truth, and they can keep to their truth. They can establish their moral codes within that group and we're just going to keep ourselves here and we're fine you know let's isolate ourselves let's build a fortress around us and we're fine let them deal with other moral standards and moral issues so people with rocky soils actually hold to those positions there is another rock that's huge in our society. And a lot of Christians hold that rock right there. And it is the suspicion to absolute truth. There is no absolute truth according to the society we live in. Are you aware of that? The Bible, the Word of God, is not absolute truth. It is a great moral ethical book. It is a great way of living. It is a great advice. Things are usually not concrete. They're metaphorical. Okay? 
So the Bible is a good book to read among many other books. And if you have decided to order your path along the Bible, that's okay. But by all means, don't tell me that this is the absolute truth. This is the worldview that is supporting right now by the community that's outside of these walls. And it is truly the worldview of the global community. Postmodernism had truly licked into every community in this country and abroad. So it's not difficult to imagine that is, this is the permeating culture out there that we that sit here in this audience carry the rocks of pluralism, of relativism, of suspicion to absolute truth. Some of us hold to the Bible as inerrant and authoritative and being the norm, but many others doubt that, and they call themselves Christians. So Jesus talks to those type of heart's conditions and says that actually when persecution launches against that sort of people because they have no root, because they have no root, they cannot sustain. And they're done. They go. Persecution, in reality, by the way, as bad as it may sound, it really pushes a person to reevaluate everything that they stand for. And young people, I just want to talk to you for a minute. Because you have to realize what you stand on. And if you're going to allow your friends to influence you, what is right and what is wrong? What is moral? What is ethical? What is a good thing? How are you going to act? Are you going to get with other groups of, of young men and women that do things that are morally unethical? But because your friends accept that, is it acceptable to you? Because your friends go and do things that your parents are not going to allow you to do. That doesn't make it right. Just because there is a big peer pressure at school, that doesn't make it right. What you need to do is look into your heart and find the rocks that are really fighting the seed of God, his word, to grow and bring fruit in your life. Because I'll tell you what, if you truly stand for the rock that is the salvation in your life, then others would actually see your example. And they're going to look at you and they're going to say, wow. Look at that person that had made a difference. I think I can be just like them. And I do not have to follow the faulty thinking of the whole society. You guys can truly be the example and the model for many of your peers. And in like manner, I'm talking to all of us adults. We don't have to fold it at work. When we begin to talk about ideas, you don't have to agree with your colleagues that things that they say are right and you know to the core of your being that they're wrong. You can stand for what you believe in or yes, persecution will come and then you have to make a choice. And if you truly do not root yourself on the word of God and his revealed reality, then it may be too late when true persecution launches against you. You would not have rooted yourself on the truth of God and you won't be able to sustain. Your worldview, in essence, would be unchristian because you haven't rooted yourself on the truth of God. But I want to give you the good news of persecution. <laughs> Most often, because persecution truly, truly, truly makes us reevaluate who we are to see the depths of things and to make a stand, persecution brings revival. 
And most big revivals in the globe have come after persecution against Christians. And that may not be the most popular message about persecution in this country. But it may be a healthy shake-up for us. So we can truly align and see where we have rooted ourselves in. Do we truly possess Christian culture, Christian worldviews, or we support the unchristian worldviews? Now, the thorny, the third heart's condition is the thorny um, land that the seed falls on. And I'll read it to you. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. I want to submit that to you. The, the thorny condition is what goes on in the brain. Okay? We're talking about worries, wealth chasing, lusts for unwholesome things. All of that destructive brain activity renders the word of God unfruitful. Just look at that again. He says that it is the worries of life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires of other things can choke what has germinated, what had begun to grow. The brain is an extremely important part of who we are. How we protect our brains, what we allow to go on in our brains is, is, is of utmost significance. We cannot live our minds out of loving God because that is not what the first commandment is. You know, we have to love God with everything we have, including mind, it says, okay? So how we conditioned our mind, our brain, is extremely important. So the rocky soil was, where was your core being? It was the heart. And the thorny soil is, how's, what's going on in your brain? How the things with your mind. I want to read from First Peter uh, chapter 1, 13 through 16. And he says that. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Why? Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children... Do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he, called you, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. Wow. Wow. So our holiness actually ties immediately in a linear re relationship with what? Peter says, prepare your minds for action. Prepare your minds for action. Prepare your minds for action. And as you prepare your minds, you can keep yourself holy by the presence of Christ in you. But if you do not prepare your mind for action, you are setting yourself for disaster. If you allow all kinds of desires, of deceitful lusts to grow in your mind, those destructive thought processes begin to run rampant in your mind. And they begin to haunt you with all kinds of negativism, with all kinds of things that, that entice you to do the wrong thing, to go after the pluralism and to go after the relativism and everything else that the word of God stands against. And let me tell you, we exist in a society right now that's all about feelings. Everything is right if it feels right. I can do whatever makes me happy 
because all is about emotions. Nothing is about emotions. Your emotions would lie to you. This is the most、um, the the one thing in your person that you cannot trust. Emotions are fleeting. You cannot base your beliefs and your actions on your emotions. Prepare your mind for action. Be self-controlled. That means you have to take off the old self and put on the new self very intentionally. The brain has to go through a daily bath, okay? <laughs> through the cleansing blood, through the Word of God that you're going to be reading. You have to prepare your mind so. You have to set. Look at what Peter says. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. You're setting your foundation in Christ. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires. When you had, when you lived in ignorance. Now, since today you do not live in ignorance anymore, you have absolutely no reason to sustain thorny ground for the word of God. Get the thorny condition out of your brains. There is no reason you have to maintain a thorny, full of thistles condition in your brain. Your brain now has to be a nice, worked-up soil that has no resemblance to the thorns that you had before you turned to Christ. You cannot go after the lusts of the flesh. You cannot be bad steward over your income. You cannot think that as I feel, I need to act. Peter says, prepare your minds for action. And when you have prepared your minds to act according to the instruction of the Word of God, then guess what? That Word would actually penetrate deep, have good root system, and begin to grow and produce the fruit. Thirty, sixty, maybe a hundred. But you have the responsibility. Of your brain's soil condition. The fourth soil type he talks about that we all like to believe that we are in that, and you know what? That has to be the aspiration for everyone to be the productive soil condition. It says in verse twenty, others like seed sown on good soil hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop some thirty, some sixty, some a hundred times. What was sown? Fantastic, fantastic. That's where we all want to be. So, how do we get there? How do we truly produce fruit? Is God speaks His word and implants it in all of us? Because as we saw, that even on the path, the word doesn't just lay on top of that trampled ground, but it still penetrates, and the devil has to really work to get it out. To take it out from you, so the Holy Spirit sows the word and it penetrates. But how do we assure that that seed produces fruit? It's simple. Let's do the opposite of the other three soil conditions. First of all, put filters. Put filters. Do not allow for everybody to trample on you. Do not be swayed by any idea that you hear. Put filters. Protect your soil of who you let walk in your circle of influence, and who have access to your spiritual formation. You have your willpower to reject. What is not right, what is not godly, and you have to resist the devil. And what is the word saying? 
he will flee away from you. He has absolutely no power over you. So put your filters on, protect yourself, and the devil will flee away from you. And let me tell you, you do not do that on your own, with your own strength. But the one that's in you is much stronger than the one that's in the world. So do not fear the lies of Satan who comes and says, I have the right to take away the promise of God in your life. You look him in the eye and you say, you, Satan, live and run from here because you have no right to trample over me. For I belong to Jesus Christ, and the one that resides in me is so much stronger than the one that's in the world. And Satan, you have absolutely no choice but to flee. The second thing you need to do is to protect your heart, your core being. Anchor your belief system on the biblical worldview and not on the prevalent worldview that's out there. Just because the society thinks so, just because the majority may think so, that doesn't make it right. And it's extremely important that we root ourselves into the Christian culture because the unchristian culture is invading with full force. And if they can have their day, they will trample all over us. But we truly, as representatives, as the bride of Christ, have to rise up as a counterculture to what's out there and to show the face of the bridegroom. Or how else are they going to know what they're missing? If we're just going to be a subculture to the unchristian culture, how are they going to be attracted to the Savior? How are we lifting up the cross? But if we root ourselves in what the Word of God says and we practice it, then we are beginning to toss the rocks of the majority's worldview. And we are truly beginning to root ourselves into the Christian worldview. That is how you're preparing your heart for productivity. In the third place, we have to prepare the minds for action and do not allow destructive thought processes to enter our brain activity. This is huge. This is huge. Dear friends, this is truly huge because a lot of the battle we battle daily is here. It's right here. Our minds go rampant. And the enemy knows that, and he loves to lie to us. He's the father of lies. And what else does he like to do? He comes to steal, kill, and what else? Destroy. Okay? So his purpose, when it comes to your brain activity, is to come to steal the peaceful, rightful thoughts that the Word of God has sown into your mind. Okay? He comes in and snatches those. But uh, by the way, again, remember, it's not that easy for him to snatch. He has to dig some. And you know what that looks like? He comes with thoughts. He begins to contradict the word of God. I mean, didn't he do that at the very beginning? Did God say so? That's what he said to Eve. Oh, are you sure? Oh, let, let, let me paraphrase what, the, what God said. He didn't quite mean that then he begins to really entertain a dialogue with you. Feeds you half-truths from the Word of God. He did the same thing with Jesus when he took him on the 40-day, when he actually interrupted Jesus' 40-day <laughs> with the Lord, you know, getting prepared for ministry. You know, he began to do that. Oh, well, let me quote some scripture to you. And he used every scripture with the wrong intent. That's exactly what he does. 
He comes and starts messing up with your brains. And he starts saying, did God truly say that? Oh, this is not what he meant. It's okay for you to just kind of have an affair on the side. Hey, a couple of times going drinking, you know, smoking and going doing this and going doing that and just, you know, hey, it's only kids, you know. It's, we're only experimenting with drugs. It's all right. We can stand after that. You know, we can just really toss it and that's all right. We, we're not going to go deep into those things. Oh, well, we truly love each other. We cannot wait for marriage. You know, who waits for marriage anymore? I mean, like, third date. Oh, well, the majority goes in bed, maybe out the third date. See, I actually waited to the tenth. I'm much better than the majority, okay? I mean, these are the thoughts that the enemy tries to bring to your mind for you to begin to entertain. And the first time, you kind of shake it off. It's like, whoa, 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 I'm not going there. I'm not going there. But the second time, he brings it. And the third time, he brings it. And he also brings some images. Oh, well, pornography is not too bad. At least I'm not really cheating on my wife. I'm just sitting and very innocently looking at the screen of the computer. And just things just pop up. And, oh, well, I'm just not clicking the, the button fast, fast enough. So, I, you know, it just, you know, I'm just looking here, looking there. Not much. Not much is going on. I'm not going to get into those things. And about a few months later, you find yourself in a place where you cannot run away from. Because what you have allowed your brain to entertain now has really caught you and caught you deep. And instead of you controlling it, it's controlling you. So that's why Peter says, prepare your minds for action. This is the only way you can be holy, just as your God is holy. That's what you're called to do. What is holy? Separate. It's a separate culture. It's a counterculture of the existing culture. But when we do all of that, when we put filters and we do not allow to be trampled by everybody, including the enemy of our souls, when we put our core belief system deep into the biblical worldviews, and when we prepare our minds for action, Michael, you can come. We have been set to produce and to produce multiple, multiple fruit. Maybe 30, maybe 60, maybe 100. But you know what? You're going to be saved. <laughs> At least you're going to produce yourself, you know, just, all right? The whole grain would be there. But not only you're going to be saved, but you will be the salvation to many. 30 maybe around you are going to be saved as you point to the truth of Christ. Maybe 60 around you, maybe 100. you truly will produce the result of God's word that has been spoken to you. I know this, this word is not, you know, necessarily jumping and clapping hands this morning. As it has, uh, it has spoken to me. It has spoken to my heart as I prepared it. I'd like to give us all the opportunity to linger before the Lord and to make some decisions before the Lord that we would put our filters on that we would work on our hearts and our minds that we can truly represent the bridegroom that we can be the bride I'll give you some time around the altars to linger I'd like for the um, for the altar workers to come to the front if there are people that have some needs you may have even physical needs that you'd like for us to pray I'd like Jay if you would come you know with your team for healing if somebody would uh, uh, would like to come for healing you know and then others that, that would be praying with people that may have to make life choices today Jay is right here if some of you have any physical needs you can come and pray for healing and and if any of you just, just truly feel that they, you guys need to, you need a support, you need a prayer support for anything that's going on in your life, or if you have to make a life choice adjustment, 
by all means, we're right here. We will be praying with you. The rest of you are dismissed. And we're going to continue with the connection groups in about five minutes. <laughs>